Good afternoon uh, once again from uh, Jitex Impact 2023 Dubai. Very pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Mul'am bin Lillahum, uh, Group CEO, Sustainable Square. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we are at uh, Jitex Impact, uh, Year of Sustainability, weeks away from uh, COP28. Uh, technology and the ICT sector overall plays a crucial role in advancing ESG and the energy transition uh, across the world. What about the region? Uh, first, thank you so much, Salah, for, uh, for inviting me to be part of this platform. Uh, we are at Jetex Impact. Uh, this is the first year where Jetex Global decided to have a hall just to focus on impact, ESG, sustainability and technology. And then the expectation was to see few startups that have contributed to the value chain to accelerate the value chain for energy transition and sustainability. But then we did not expect that we can have all these markets that has been hidden so far, you know, before. But then today we see a lot of startups that have really invested and put hardwares and softwares into the service of energy transition and sustainability. Pretty much amazed if you look around and you go around and you see around the booth and you see the innovation and how the application of both technologies, AI, artificial intelligence, regenerative AI and blockchain into the service of climate change transition. It's, a, it's amazing what we're seeing here. Uh, in terms of software's data uh, and ESG reporting, data plays a crucial role. Some people say there is an influx of uh, data. Some people believe that there's a shortage of data and the time that plays in it. How can we advance that? I, th I think um, uh, our presence here, obviously, you know, at Jitex Impact, we're launching our first uh, uh, AI-powered uh, ESG software. But it's not like any ESG software. So on a personal level, I've been in the industry for about 18 years. And 18 years, I've been through a lot of scenarios for disclosure and reporting exercises. And you have no idea, Salah, how complex and, and, and tiring is the exercise. So companies spend at least on average five to six months to produce their sustainability report. And the nightmare of any sustainability report is identifying the data and collecting that data, which is not obvious and it's not an easy process because you're dealing with different stakeholders internally from different geographical locations, from different departments in order to collect that data validate the data and make a meaning out of that data in a report that unfortunately before we used to see it that being shelved that nobody reads mm -hmm. today there is a global appetite for that particular data from the investors from different stakeholders so when i looked at this process and i say this process could be automated and then we looked at all the softwares around the world that are existing for ESG data and all these softwares they help you to collect this data aligned with specific frameworks, which is great. That's exactly what you're looking for. Any standards frameworks is there. But then when it comes to reporting on that data, they only allow you to download the same data that you have uploaded. Mm -hmm. It's the same data you've uploaded, yeah. but then what's the point of uploading the data and downloading the same data without really making a meaning of the data and putting it in a context of a GRI report? So I said, what if we create an algorithm that does collect the data 31st of December and the 1st of January, you should be able to click and generate an entire report aligned with all the frameworks, mistakes free, and then AI, fully AI powered. And we developed the algorithm. So today, the software that we are launching, it's called Squarely. It does an entire auto drafting of a sustainability report on 1st of January. We are cutting budget, cutting uh, resources cutting time, which is crucial, especially that the jurisdictions and regulations today are pushing companies to, as fast as possible, produce the report. And then today, for example, if you look at both stock markets, 31st of December, you need to have your data out. Companies spend six months to develop the report. So what if creating a technology that does it in one day, and we've done it? Uh, so basically, in terms of uh, ESG reporting, it's something becoming mandatory in the United Arab Emirates. We have the uh, we saw the unified uh, laws for the uh, GCC central banks. Uh, how can we make ESG like something fat accompli just to put it on the website, but to adopt and embrace the ESG throughout the year? So see, see, e when it comes to ESG or sustainability practices, it does not stop at the reporting itself, because the reporting is. It, it has to be as, as a celebration of all the activities that yes. you've done during the year. You put them together there in a story that enhances your equity story because investors today are really pushing for this just to, to open up a story for this. 
uh, there was a, a big meeting in London where they invited all the IRs to meet with the investors. And the investors went there, the IR managers went there. When they met with the investors, the investors told them, uh, before showing me your financials, show me your ESG data, then I will speak financials with yeah. you. That was a shock yeah. to all of them. So what we are trying to, to, to say here that it's super important to report and to disclose and to put that, but there is a lot of work that has to be done before into setting up the framework the governance system, the culture is super important. We always say that uh, culture eats uh, strategy for breakfast. Yeah. So you might develop the most sophisticated strategy with KPIs and roadmaps, but if you don't have the right culture for yeah. ESG and sustainability, things would never flourish. ESG literacy is something that we have been encountering. There is a severe uh, lack of ESG literacy in the MENA region worldwide, and especially in the Middle East. Uh, how can we develop that? How can we... So, uh, Salah is a very, very, very exciting question to me because as an ESG expert, believe it or not, I have to be an engineer to understand carbon. I have to be a lawyer to understand compliance. I have to be a social worker to understand CSR. I have to be uh, uh, an investment expert to understand responsible investment. I have to be a banker to understand sustainable finance. There's so much of skills that gets into the persona of an ESG expert today. So how can we develop someone or train someone to acquire all these skills together in one person? Yeah. So that's why I always tell people, don't be intimidated by the, the so-called ESG expertise, mm -hmm. because as an ESG manager, you're not going to do it on your own. Yeah. You need to reach out to all the heads of departments and heads of units, the engineer, the head of marketing, the head of carbon, the head of uh, facility management, the, the CFO, the CTO, the, all of them, and everyone has to play a role in it. Yeah. Don't keep it to yourself. Yeah. Uh, in terms of ESG laws and regulations, uh, after the unified laws of the GCC central banks uh, and ahead of COP28, many people anticipate very bullish uh, ESG uh, regulations and policies including mandatory ESG reporting, not only for the publicly listed companies, but perhaps beyond that, family offices perhaps, or even startups and SMEs. Uh, are we ready for this in the MENA region? And what do you, how do you foresee or what do you expect from COP28 in this framework? Now, COP28 is a different story because at COP28, I think what we are expecting is to channel more capital and investment towards, you know, the energy transition and the climate change. Uh, believe it or not, uh, Salah, that uh, uh, since 14 years, the, the, the humanity, they have dedicated or pledged for $100 billion to be allocated to climate transition. Up until today, we have not paid any dollar for that. Mm -hmm. So we are going to COP28 and we are hoping that the $100 billion gets deployed so we can really see, you know, allocating of the allocation of capital into green transition. And then the global south benefits from what the global uh, north emits. Now, when it comes to family businesses, they play a big role because most of the family businesses, most of them, and I speak to them on a daily basis, they're thinking of IPOs. And to think of IPOs, you have to open up to the investors and you have to enhance your equity story. Enhancing the equity story with financials only is very limited, but you have to enhance it with non-financial performance. So financial performance and non-financial performance together. When you look at the startup scene, it's a very interesting question. Startup scene or the small companies, they've never thought that they can play a role in this ESG and sustainability. But you see the tremendous opportunities today for all the startups where they put channel their innovation towards sustainable products and services. The market is a huge for that. The SDGs, when they were announced, they are $12 trillion of business opportunities. So we're not saying approach the SDGs from a CSR perspective. You have to approach them from an investment perspective. We need the startup to pay a role. We need the family businesses. We need the listed companies, the conglomerates. Everyone has got a say into this transition and they can play a role and make money from it. Uh, green investments, uh, for example, and ESG, what are the parameters and how can we enhance that? And I, I, th I think when it comes to green, I think the business case for a green investment is very clear because you put an investment and the investment, you know, has a clear ROI in the, on the long run. So, so calculating the ROI in green investment is, is, is very clear, it's very obvious, it's one plus one equal two. What is the challenge is the social investment. Yeah. You know, social investment is still a challenge because the implication or the impact of climate change into the social context is super obvious today. Yeah. 
So how can we create more ROIs, visible ROIs in the social context, but the green investment, very clear. Uh, the dialogue in terms of discussions uh, on ESG as a whole differ between Europe, uh, the United States, even now UK after breakfast, uh, Brexit, <laughs> and the Middle East uh, plus uh, Asia. Uh, what is next for ESG in the MENA region? I think the the Middle Eastern economy are opening up to the global north. You know, so 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 you see, for we have a lot of companies that are exporting to Europe, and Europe has put a lot of taxes, you know, uh, for uh, import importers of products to Europe. So obviously, if you're importing to Europe and you want to remain active in that market, you need to work on your um, uh, ESG investment and you need to cut your emission in order to be more competitive there. That's one thing. The second thing, a lot of uh, Middle Eastern companies they go to Europe to pitch to institutional investors. And institutional investors are raising the bar you know, for ESG and saying, you know, we want to work with you, but then you have to show us data, you have to show us that you are serious about this and you are actively working there. So the Middle East market is super uh, impacted by all this pressure coming and the increasing regulation, not to mention the local regulation and the regional regulations that are happening around us. So the, it, we are in fast track, I would say in a fast track in order to really transition as fast as possible and ensure a green economy as much as possible to continuously attract capital and capital holders. Munam, thank you very much for being with us today at Jatex so Impact. Thank you so much, Salah, and then all the best for the family of Iyajimina. Thank you.